ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. All right, Superhumans, Boomer Anderson, back with another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. I'm down in Argentina having a little time with the fam, getting to spend a little bit of time in the sun in this European winter. But as you know, I believe that performance is a complex system. There are items like nutrition, sleep, as well as exercise that people think of immediately, right away. But there's lesser known items like mindset, stress, etc., that need more attention. But today we're going to go down one of those verticals, and that vertical is the vertical of movement, specifically weightlifting. And my guest today, and this one is a conversation that I've wanted to have for oh so long, because you guys know that I love weightlifting, right? My guest today is Manuel Buitrago, and Manuel received his honorary coaching credential in weightlifting from Chengdu Sports University in Sichuan, China. He has been traveling to China since 2003 and furthered his weightlifting knowledge by studying and translating Chinese sports science research articles, manuals, and textbooks on weightlifting written by Chinese sports scientists and coaches. Manuel was mentored by coach Ma Jinping, where he learned Chinese weightlifting technique and training methods. He's furthered his lifting ability and knowledge by traveling to various training bases in China where he trained with professional Chinese weightlifters. Coach Manuel has taught Chinese weightlifting technique, theory, and programming in China as well as all over the world. He's worked with Olympic and world-level weightlifters as well as high-level CrossFit athletes from various countries. His knowledge of the Chinese language and culture allows him to bridge language barriers and convey the essence behind Chinese weightlifting methods to Western audiences without really changing the content. He's conducted Chinese weightlifting seminars in Spanish, Portuguese, and is working on Italian translations. So not only does the guy speak a lot of languages, but he's an expert on Chinese weightlifting technique. Now, why is that significant? Well, the Chinese have been among the best weightlifters in the world for several years now. And I think Manuel's mentor in particular is a key player in that formulation or in that success. And so what did we get into on the podcast? Because this podcast, it was a lot of fun for me, particularly as a person who is pretty bad at the snatch technique. And so we talked a little bit about what is Chinese weightlifting, specifically what is the essence of Chinese weightlifting, why repetition matters in Chinese weightlifting in particular, how to better one snatch, and really just sort of mixing it up between cardiovascular or calisthenic work versus weightlifting. And I ask a lot of questions just about weightlifting technique in general. So you're going to want to check out the show notes for this one. They're at decodingsuperhuman.com slash ma strength that's m a s t r e n g t h enjoy my episode with manuel brutrago sponsor for this episode is the ring on my finger no i'm not married yet and frankly before this ring i hated wearing rings but i must say the guys at aura have done a great job The Aura Ring allows me to track all sorts of crazy things about my sleep, including my resting heart rate, my deep sleep stages, my REM sleep, etc., etc. I really enjoy the feedback, and it allows me to make lifestyle decisions to become a higher performer. Let me give you an example. So prior to getting the Aura Ring, I would fast essentially 16 hours after my last meal. It didn't matter when that last meal was. However, when I look at my resting heart rate and how that really correlates to my performance the next day, I know I want my lowest resting heart rate coming as soon as possible after going to sleep because that's when all my recovery really starts. So what did I do? Well, it allowed me to adjust really when my last meal was before going to bed. So I have my last meal now earlier in the night. I get better sleep. I get higher quality sleep. And I must say, the next day feels amazing. So if you want to check out the Aura Ring, and if you want to pick one up yourself, go to AuraRing.com. That's O-U-R-A ring.com. Plug in the code BOOMER. 
and you'll get $50 off your order or 50 euros depending on your jurisdiction. I really hope you enjoy the ring and on with the show. Manuel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, it's an absolute pleasure and I, I look forward to, um, to discussing the topic of Chinese weightlifting with you today. But I, w- I have to ask the question, how did you discover it yourself? Well, I first uh, started uh, getting interested in weightlifting in college, which was uh, back in around 2001, 2002. And um, I remember seeing an old Iron Mind DVD from Randall Strassen. And his coverage was mainly of European lifters, but he made this one DVD about Chinese weightlifters. And I saw that what was on that DVD was so different from uh, what his other work showed. And I had been trying to figure out weightlifting because I didn't have a coach at the time. And the technique that I saw in the Chinese DVD was so interesting that I, I wanted to learn more. And I was going to study abroad in China anyway. So I started looking for ways to try to in, uh, do what little there was about Chinese weightlifting. And I went to China to learn Chinese language and culture and history and whatnot. And I couldn't get into the training halls at the time, but eventually later on, I met coach Ma, my colleague through a friend, and he was one of the first Olympians for China and in weightlifting. And so uh, I spoke with him and uh, he agreed to uh, show me what his coach showed him. And his coach was one of the founders of the Chinese weightlifting system. So I was in a lucky position to learn uh, from the creators. And, uh, and I also can speak, read, and write Chinese. So I was able to learn it uh, in a very direct way. Well, thank you for taking the time to record this, by the way, on Chinese New Year or the week of Chinese New Year. Yeah, it's the year of the pig. Exactly, exactly. But do you mind walking through some of those principles of Chinese weightlifting? Because uh, I know myself, I'm quite familiar with some of the other ones that you mentioned, but also Westside and a few others. But the differences between Chinese weightlifting and some of these other uh, programs that people traditionally know. So in China, a lot of sports, they have guiding principles that are used to train the sport and and guide coaches into how to develop athletes and what they should be striving for. So in weightlifting, uh, there are five words uh, that are used, but other sports can have more or fewer words. So it just so happens that there's five for Chinese weightlifting. And these words were developed by Ma's coach uh, when he was an athlete. So when Ma's coach was an athlete at the time, China was trying to learn from Russia, Bulgaria, uh, well, at his time, just Russia and America. But as an athlete, he didn't have a high level of education. So he just had his own philosophy about how to do a perfect lift. And so he said that if you can follow the principles of close, fast, low timing and stable, you can make a perfect lift. So when he talked about close, he was referring to keeping the barbell close to the body, but also keeping the body close to the barbell throughout the entire movement. When he talked about fast, he was referring to making sure that the barbell moved fast, Uh, not so much the body. The body should just transfer energy from the floor all the way to overhead. And his third word was low. And that referred to catching the barbell in as low a position as possible so that you can maximize the amount of weight uh, that you catch. And when he was an athlete, he uh, just used those three words. But when he became a coach, he and his, uh, his colleague got together and with uh, research and, and developing athletes, they added two more words. They added uh, timing or rhythm. Uh, which refers to being able to do the lift in a way that minimizes the amount of descent on the barbell so that there's no uh, excessive stress on the joints. And then the final word was stable, because if you can uh, stay within a certain 
area, basically the area formed by your feet or your squat stance, and you stay in the middle of that, then you can uh, guarantee your result, guarantee your lift. Because sometimes you can, you've seen world championships where athletes will do a heavy weight or attempt to set a new world record, and then they stand up with the lift and then they run around the platform and they, lo- and they lose the weight or they get hurt in the process. That energy, that attempt, they, they made the lift, but they wasted the attempt because they just weren't stable. He said, if you could incorporate those five words, internalize them and train them, then you can have a perfect lift. You can have uh, a lift that will maximize the amount of weight lifted uh, with the least amount of stress on the body. This is absolutely fascinating to me. Now, when I look at what I've read about Chinese weightlifting, there's a, a very strong emphasis on the, or there's a description of the quadriceps as a, a main muscle, or maybe I have that word wrong. Why are, are the quadriceps so important in, in weightlifting? I think that's just due more to the result of the technique. It's, it's not, I mean, you need, I think people feel it more in the quads uh, because of, uh, of how this technique is taught. So in China, your balance uh, should be on the ball of the foot. And your goal is to maintain that balance through the pull, so through the high pull. Uh, Whereas uh, some people will teach for athletes to be balanced over the middle of the foot. Some people uh, say they prefer the heel. Some people say you should start on the ball and then move to the heel or move from the ball, the heel, and then back onto the ball. Uh, There's a lot of opinions on where to be balanced in the start position. But in China, the goal is to start on the ball and stay on the ball through the extension. And that mimics uh, a natural vertical jump the most. And it also, uh, being on the ball of the foot is your end position when you do a high pull. So if you start anywhere else and try to move onto the ball, it's very easy to overshoot or you can undershoot, in which case you skip over that spot if you ever get there at all. So they figured better to start there and stay there uh, through the movement because then you guarantee that you'll be in that high pull position. So because of that, because you're a little bit more forward than you would be if you were uh, balanced anywhere else, your ankle and your knee uh, are going to be uh, flexed a little bit more so those joints are going to have to do a little bit more work than they would if the barbell were closer to the shin, say over uh, the middle of the foot or even the talus. It's just more of a matter of where the balance point is rather than you know Chinese coaches thinking that the quads are just the most important thing. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Now, the emphasis on repetition, and I've had the pleasure of watching both your Instagram account, but also several videos of some of the camps that you guys have run. The emphasis on repetition, and you and I were discussing this before we clicked record. Do you mind just going through uh, how that is constructed in terms of accessories versus primary movements and why uh, you may have to go through uh, uh, multiple repetitions before actually progressing on to the main lift, if I have that right. You want repetition because you're, you're training a skill. You're training the ability to snatch and clean and jerk heavy weights. So when you train, you want to focus on the quality of your training. It doesn't help you to make a lift if it's really ugly or you deviated from uh, proper technique because that's a completely different motor pattern and it's one that can... Uh, lead to injury. So you want to develop uh, you know, that perfect skill of snatching and cleaning, and jerking heavyweights with good technique. So there's going to be a lot of repetition involved through assistance movements and uh, through uh, the actual lifts themselves. As I think about this, or as somebody in the audience who may not have delve too much into Chinese weightlifting principles. How do you measure things like uh, overtraining? Because when, or at least when I've approached the sport of CrossFit, I have a tendency to just go overboard. Is there any particular 
kind of measurement that you look for in overtraining or do you have certain sort uh, scheduling of, of training where you have like three days on one day off, et cetera? Well, the, the coaches in China have a lot of resources to monitor uh, an athlete's uh, a competitive state. So they'll look at bio, biochemical indicators. So they'll look at levels of testosterone, cortisol, hemoglobin, and other uh, uh, chemicals and indicators to assess how the athlete is responding to training. So they'll get a baseline level of indicators and then they'll go through a program and they'll see how the how those indicators change with the program, seeing that, okay, this week is a high intensity week, this is a high volume week, this is high on both, and just see how that athlete moves or how those indicators move. And then uh, they get a better sense of, of what's going on on the inside. But they also focus on the outside. So they'll see how's the technique quality coming along, how's the speed How's the um, the athlete's energy? How's their uh, emotion? How's their appetite? Uh, sleep quality? Their heart rate? Uh, things like that. They combine the internal and external to try to get a more complete uh, picture of of how the athlete is feeling. Do you know how many times they test an athlete? Are they testing them weekly or is it monthly? Uh, I, I'm just more for my own edification. Well. Uh, the the easiest things like quality, speed, technique, I mean, those are looked at every day, every training session. Chemical indicators, they can be done daily or weekly. It really depends on what the research arm of that particular training base is is doing and where the athlete is in their training. So they might be trying to experiment on how to better prepare you know, a certain cadre of athletes for the Olympics or for world championships or more general training. So it really depends. But I've seen, I've been to bases where they'll do it like on a weekly basis. And then some indicators uh, require more long-term monitoring, monitoring. So they'll do that over a longer period. And for some, they'll do it. It's just a short-term measure. So they'll do it once uh, when uh, during the relevant time and then go from there. Manuel, I want to take just a, a quick step back to a sort of just weightlifting in general, but also how you would approach trying to achieve a level of maybe not mastery, but proficiency in weightlifting. Uh, let's just say as background, the person has a background in either powerlifting or CrossFit or just some sort of moderate level of exercise. How would you advise a, a person listening if they wanted to become proficient in the snatch and the clean and jerk? Where, where should they start? Because there's a lot of obviously different schools of thought out there. There's a lot of different ways to teach it. But where, where do you think people should get started? I think people should focus on their flexibility, first and foremost, because we take people to China to train with professional athletes. And one of the things that our campers see is that the athletes there are very mobile and flexible. They're able to get to really deep positions while still maintaining uh, stability and their body position. And then when our participants try, you know, it's, it's, it's harder than it looks. So I would say, you know, building up your mobility, especially in your ankle and your hips, your flexibility uh, with the corresponding muscles, also being able to be mobile enough in your thoracic spine and uh, flexible in the shoulder uh, to be in a good overhead position. You know, these things are, are very important because if you, if you can't do that, it's hard to try to implement any technique. So I would say, you know, flexibility is, is immobility. Those are the, the biggest things that people need to work on if they really want to get proficient in weightlifting. After going through just sort of, let's say you've spent a number of sometimes months or in my case years uh, reversing some mobility issues, where would you tell them to progress afterwards? Is it just a matter of finding the right trainer or is it uh, practicing certain accessory movements? How would you take them through a, a progression on that sort of step step two point on the way to proficiency? Well, when, when we do seminars, we teach the progression uh, that was uh, developed by Ma's coach. And so we just take it step by step. And 
when an athlete is is learning, you know, you only take them as far as as their uh, mobility uh, can go. And then you do strength training around that so that they're still training other physical qualities like strength, power, and speed and flexibility, but also trying to incorporate all of that into technique. Really just sort of training the weaknesses. If I summarize it as sort of training the weaknesses until you get up the progression level, do I have that right? Yeah. So all of this is trying to get you to snatch. So you will do, you will go as far as you can go with good technique in terms of a technical progression. And then your assistance movements will be there to at least maintain your strengths, but then focus on your weaknesses. And then you'll go back to the progression and try to go further so that you can do the, the full lift without issue. And then once you, once you can do a full lift without issue, you still, you then just train the assist, use assistance movements to train where the weakness is as that lift gets heavier. You might be able to do uh, 70% with great technique, but then at 80%, it starts to get a little wobbly and shaky. And around 90%, it's, uh, it's very iffy. You know, you'd, as a coach, you'd have to look at where and how the lift is breaking down and then uh, choose assistance movements to help address those issues. So the assistance movements are done throughout the week so that uh, to build those qualities, but you're always doing full snatch and full clean and jerk uh, at least once a week uh, so that you can take those uh, skills and incorporate them into the skill of full snatching and full clean and jerking. Is there a particular ratio that you guys use in terms of accessory movement versus full movement, or is that all determined based on where the individual is at that moment? It's individual. Uh, You know, when you are in a training cycle, the farther out you are, the more assistance movements you will do and less full lifts. As you get closer to a competition, more of your volume will be full lifts and you'll have uh, the assistance movements pared down. It also depends on your level. So, you know, if you are just uh, starting and you're young, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of other things to work on your athletic qualities and just doing technique work for weightlifting, usually with a stick or an empty bar. And then as you progress uh, over the years, the percentage of that general athletic training decreases and then the volume of weightlifting training increases. One of the common characteristics of people that I speak to or the common questions that they have is really how to stay involved, motivated in any sort of exercise program. And, you know, Manuel, you went to China, you said, I think in 2001, right? Uh, I was in 2003. So 2003, and you became interested in in Chinese weightlifting. You've been working with this philosophy for a very long time. And one of the chapters in your book, or the the Ma Strength book, is about training willpower. And I was wondering if you can go into some of those principles, because lifelong training uh, does take quite a lot of willpower to just get out of bed some days. Do you mind going into sort of how you guys work with that with athletes? The, the coaches there, they, you know, they, they have strict requirements for technique and they, they aim for excellence. Uh, they don't let the small mistakes slide. If you, you know, if you went for a new personal best and you made it and there was a small mistake, that's fine. Uh, you know, the, the coach might be happy that you hit that weight for mental reasons. Maybe you had a mental barrier, even if it wasn't perfect. But, you know, the coach will still work on making sure that you can do that weight with uh, solid technique. Having strict requirements lets you know where you have to go, where, like where you have to end up. So I think a lot of people, they know that a snatch is basically ground to overhead. But how to get there and what it should really look like is really depends on who you're watching on the Internet. So in, in China, they have their standard, their standard technique. And so the athlete knows what it looks like, where, where they have to go and what they have to do to get there. So once you know the goal and you have a defined road of getting there, uh, then it makes it a lot easier to uh, stick with a plan and practice, uh, frequently. So if somebody had a really good trainer that can map out multi-year 
I don't know if you'd call it puritization, but multi-year puritization that would serve them a lot better than just going through like a four to six week program, I guess. They, they have that and they use that. And I think that does help, uh, some athletes, but I think just on the day to day, you know, you have, you know, a defined goal. So something shorter. So for example, during the summer, your coach might say, okay, between the beginning of this summer and the end of this summer, you need to add three kilos to your snatch and two kilos to your clean and jerk. And so five kilos to your total. Okay. So that is a very clearly defined and the coach will say, and we are going to do X, Y, and Z to do that. We're going to work on, say, we're going to work on your leg strength. We're going to work on your positioning at the extension because it tends to be a little bit off. And we're going to also uh, do some uh, some of these assistance movements to uh, support this goal. So when your coach says that you have a you have a goal, you have a clearly defined path. It makes it a lot easier to train rather than if your coach has said, "Okay, we need to we need to increase your total by the end of the summer." You know, that's a little bit that's more vague, and there's no plan, so it's very hard to know, you know, to feel confident about what you're doing if whether if it's enough or not. So defining very specific goals, laying out a path to that enables the athlete, frankly, just to focus on the work. Um, if I have that correct, is that right? It's just more of execution. Right. And the goals should be reachable. You know, you're, I mean, we all want to uh, increase our total, but you know, the coach is not going to say, you know, you need 20 kilos in six weeks. You know, that's uh, that's impossible, but it should be something that the athlete should feel is attainable. And so, uh, that puts it within their control, you know, and the coach and there should be some faith in the coach as well, knowing that the coach is not going to let them be reckless or, you know, uh, that the coach is, you know, knows technique, knows what they're doing. Having that helps you just focus on your own work. Manuel, more of a personal question, actually, since I have you on the line, I have to, I have to ask this one. If you see an athlete and I'm not naming names, but it may be me, um, catching snatches with sort of a bent arm. Is that just a flexibility issue or is that more of, and you may not be able to answer this right here, but it is, or is that more of just not being able to handle the weight overhead? Um, it depends. If you, if you could, if you try to straighten your arm and it's still bent, then that's a bone issue, you know? So there are some athletes that just physically, it, uh, cannot straighten their arm, you know, overhead it, it, uh, straight. It just, it's just very bent. And that has more to do with the structure of the elbow. So in those cases, there's really nothing you can do about that. You just live with it. But if you can straighten your arm overhead without weight and without issue, then and you're still catching the barbell with bent arms, then that's a technique issue. There's something going off in the lift that's uh, throwing off your uh, ability to catch with straight arms. In in that case, is it, could it potentially be that I'm just gripping the barbell too narrow, or is it? I mean, I guess there's multi factors that could go into that. Oh yeah, I mean, there's the it, it it could be it could be many things. I mean, it, it could be direct. It could be the fact that yeah, you're gripping it too hard. But usually, when something happens in the lift, uh, the coach needs to look at least one or two steps before the issue to try to identify the cause. Because if um, a lot of times the problems that we see in the lift are symptoms of an underlying cause, you know, you might see the bent arms and you might say, okay, we need to work on your overhead it needs to be stronger. So we need to do a lot of overhead assistance and a lot of tricep work and shoulder work to strengthen the uh, your catch position, et cetera. But it might just be that, you know, your second pull is really off and it causes the bar to loop. And so, and it throws off your rhythm. So then the barbell is always uh, crashing on you. So no matter how strong you are, you know, you have this barbell that has a lot of momentum and it's falling on you and your arms bend as a result. It, you know, you can do as much tricep work and catch uh, assistance work that works on your catch, but that's still not fixing the issue. This is very helpful for me, by the way, because I have that specific issue. And I think what you just described about the loop and catching a falling barbell may actually be what's going on with me. But um, thank you for that. Now, a lot of your athletes are extremely lean. And with Olympic lifting, there's obviously weight categories and things. How do you 
make sure that they maintain a certain weight? Is it purely diet or do you have cardiovascular exercises mixed in with the weightlifting? So at the professional bases, the, the diet is uh, run by uh, the base directors. So they have people that you know will select the food and it's usually local Chinese food, but they'll make selection based on the needs of the base and the needs of the athletes and then uh, go from there. And the coach will, will make some recommendations as well. You know, they might say, okay, uh, you know, no more rice for you. <laughs> you need to cut weight or you need to gain weight. So eat more. So the, the, the athletes don't think too much about their own dieting. It's already preset for them. So they just, they just eat whatever choices they're given. And, and then they go from there. Some of them, they, they might do a little bit of cardio, but most, most athletes will do calisthenics and uh, some cardio in their uh, morning training. It's part of their general athletic training. So they'll do that a few times a week uh, just to uh, help with uh, circulation and recovery and also just to get outside, you know, because, you know, you're training indoors all the time. So it helps take the mind off of, of training, also get, get prepared for the day. So you mentioned morning training. How often are these guys training? I mean, are they training six, seven times a day? Like you hear people like Rich Froning training, or are they? Is it all really dependent on the athlete? Uh, well, when we have our our camps in China, uh, the professional teams usually train about nine times a week. Those are uh, professional junior and senior athletes. And so some days there's double training, other days there's single training, and Sundays are always off. When you're younger, you know, you're tra- you might do only three, three sessions a week, you know, uh, because you still have school and you just don't need that much training at that age to make results. But then as they get older, the number of sessions increases, the total number of hours training increases until you're usually hitting about nine sessions a week. And then if you are, for some athletes, they might do more. They might do up to about 13 sessions that are super short and they follow more of a Bulgarian style in the sense that it's, you know, high intensity, low volume, but full lifts. Uh, But that's usually done for a short amount of time to peak the athlete. So you might see, uh, you might do it for anywhere between two to four weeks at the most prior to a competition. And that's if the athlete responds uh, favorably to that kind of training. How old do people typically start training? Because you mentioned some of these guys training in school. And growing up, you always heard, or at least I was told that I started lifting too early at the age of 12. Like how old is, is too early to start training? Uh, the youngest athletes I've seen are about eight years old. Usually 10 is, is a good age to, uh, for most of them to start. And at that, at that age, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you're doing a lot more general uh, training. So these kids are doing a lot of jumps, a lot of sprints, just to build uh, their explosive ability, their speed. Uh, they do a lot of uh, flexibility training because it's easy for kids to, they're like Gumby. So it's easy for them to <laughs> to be flexible. So they train it so that they can keep it because when you're older, you can still get more flexible. It's just harder to do it. At those ages, they build the qualities uh, that are easy to build at that age so that they can maintain that throughout their uh, weightlifting career. So strength usually happens much later, at least in terms of weightlifting strength, but uh, body weight strength, the ability to move yourself, that kind of training, you know, that's done during that age so that athletes can build body awareness and, and physical qualities that help for weightlifting. Manuel, this is, this is super helpful. I, I just have a few more general questions on uh, overall weightlifting exercise programs because I, I would love to have your opinion since I have you. Um, just in terms of looking at, well, well, really equipment that can be used in an average gym, when we're talking the, the clean and jerk, the snatch, most of this involves a barbell. Do you ever recommend using machines with certain people or is it predominantly barbells as well as dumbbells? Uh, Yeah, machines are great. So I think they are a good way to target a a lagging muscle and it's an easy way to introduce tension to a a muscle and add volume. If you, you know, you can't snatch and clean and jerk all day and still keep up your 
technique. And even if you can, the amount of volume that you do is limited. So in order to uh, train the muscle further to get it bigger or stronger, uh, then, you know, you need to do assistance movements to do it, whether it's with a dumbbell, a cables, a band or machine, you know, uh, so in China, they use, they use everything, you know, as long as it helps contribute for that athlete to the snatch and clean and jerk. What's more important, warm up or cool down? I think both. You need both. So uh, from an injury pre uh, prevention standpoint, you know, the warm up is really important uh, because you want to make sure that uh, the muscles are firing properly, that the motor pattern is, is getting uh, trained and then with light weights to help avoid injury with submaximal or, or even maximal weights. Uh, so that, you know, that maintains the quality of your session, but then you also have to know, uh, how to cool down so that you can recover. You know, if you, if you just train and you have no recovery, then it's going to be harder to train for the next session. So you want to uh, train hard, but you also want to come down quickly and, uh, start that recovery process as soon as possible so that you can do the next session sooner or a minimum with uh, good quality and quality, meaning, you know, good, uh, good movement, good technique, good speed, uh, good strength. And what would be some of the things that like for a cool down, uh, I'm picturing stretching, mobility work, et cetera. Is there anything in particular that you get, have your athletes go through? Yeah. So a lot of the athletes will, uh, do massage right after training. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, some athletes, We'll see a, you know, a specialized massage therapist in who will give them, you know, either massage on a, on an injured area or an area that felt uh, really tweaked and they'll use whatever techniques to do that. Uh, but a lot of athletes, they're trained to massage each other. So they, they walk on each other. They'll just like hold on to a stick or a rail to balance themselves. And then they'll walk on the, on various body parts just to, uh, calm the muscle down. So they'll walk on the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes, the lower back, upper back, the triceps, biceps, and uh, even calves. This partner massage, they they do it after every session. And they'll sometimes do it beforehand, but it's it's almost always done afterwards. It's fascinating. Before we go on to the final questions, Manuel, what are your favorite books or resources out there on weightlifting? Because uh, for somebody who's ready to sort of ring up their Amazon account right now after hearing this, where would you point them towards? Well, if you want to learn about Chinese weightlifting, uh, we have a book uh, called Chinese Weightlifting on uh, ChineseWeightlifting.com. And the book it has uh, over about 200 uh, cited studies to support what's in the book. So we wanted to take a scientific approach and show what professional standard Chinese weightlifting is from the founders. So um, that would be the, the first step in terms of learning about, you know, what weight, about weightlifting technique and weightlifting training. In terms of other books, I think people should, you know, read about uh, dieting and, uh, and just science in general, because there's, uh, there's a lot of opinions about training, nutrition, and and whatnot. And it, I think that the more scientific that you can be, the better. Uh, I personally like Lyle McDonald's work on dieting, uh, his research back. He's a very good researcher and his books are, are very scientific. And, you know, it's, I feel, I always feel comfortable reading that kind of work because I know that I'm getting some, uh, an accurate assessment of the research instead of just, uh, trying to fit your, you know, your own opinion onto the research or not having any research at all. Again, this has been amazing, Manuel. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Final four rapid fire questions. What aspect of health do you feel needs more attention than it's currently, currently getting? Uh, I think recovery is a big aspect. So, uh, you know, people like to train and go hard and heavy, but you know, you also have to recover from that. Uh, otherwise you're, you're going to just pound yourself into the ground and it's very easy to stall day in and day out because you're not able to lift heavier or do more work 
because you're just not able to recover from it. I think uh, focusing on recovery is a big aspect for a lot of lifters. And I would also say, you know, the flexibility is also uh, really important for people who are uh, getting into this uh, later in life and didn't have a uh, an athletic background like uh, gymnastics or dance or something like that where they develop flexibility early on. So I would say recovery and, and flexibility. What's your favorite, uh, just part 1A here, what's your favorite thing to do for recovery for you, yourself? For me, uh, you know, I like... Uh, Sleeping, <laughs> uh, just a, a good night's sleep will will do wonders. You know, if you're tired and uh, you're you know you get up and you're groggy and you know dreading what's in store for the day, it's going to be really hard to move fast or lift heavy in those kinds of conditions. You know, a sleep just you know a, a good night's sleep goes a long way. Well said. Well said. Favorite book on high performance. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think uh, a lot of Lyle's work is really great when it comes to dieting. Uh, I think a lot of people are lost because there's just a lot of information out there, a lot of misinformation. And so uh, having uh, resources that are that are scientifically accurate goes a long way. Do you have a favorite book of his? Because I know he's published a few. Yeah. So, you know, he recently published a, a book on uh, on women which is uh, really great. Uh, and it's the, the first volume of maybe a two or multi-volume series. So it's a, it's a really great reference in terms of the science behind women's dieting. Uh, but uh, just his, 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 his guide to flexible dieting, I think is really useful uh, for a lot of people because it just it shows you how to uh, structure a diet and what, what goes into that. And it's, it's not that hard uh, once you do the little bit of number crunching necessary to figure out your, your metabolic rate, your activity level, and then uh, start playing with your uh, macros that are in the book and then going from there. So, you, you know, it's, it's all laid out and it's, uh, and it's, like you said, flexible dieting. So, you know, it's not, it's not a, uh, he's not promoting a, a strict diet, like no carbs or no fat or whatever, you know, it's basically to show you how to, how to eat a, so that you can either gain muscle or lose fat. Very helpful. What's your top trick for enhancing your focus? I think just getting rid of the noise, uh, taking time to, you know, push all the distractions out, you know, and just be there with yourself so that you can hear yourself and visualize, you know, what you want to do and have time to, uh, you know, conduct a plan for doing so. You know, when a lot of these athletes get ready for world championships, you know, they are, you know, the Chinese athletes, a lot of them are MIA until the time to compete. I mean, they'll go to the training hall to train, but then after that, you know, they, they basically just stay in their hotel room. Uh, until it's time to come out and usually, and that's just so that they don't have any distraction that they're not, uh, you know, they don't encounter anything, you know, they're not on social media and nothing. They're just by themselves, you know, visualizing and, uh, just, uh, doing some low stress things, uh, in preparation for competition. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, we're on social media. So if you go to, uh, Facebook, you know, just type in, uh, uh, Ma Strength or Chinese Weightlifting, and it'll pop up. Uh, we're on Instagram at Ma Strength, and uh, have a website uh, Chinese uh, Weightlifting dot com, uh, where we have information about the seminars that we teach around the world, and also uh, the camps that we hold uh, in China to bring people to train with uh, professional athletes and coaches. Now, can anybody do those camps in China, or do you guys have a certain selection criteria for that one? Uh, so we do have an application process to make sure that, uh, you know, that you're, you're, you're physically able to do this safely, but we're looking for people who are just open-minded people who are wanting to learn. You know, if you come to China, hoping to impress some Chinese coaches or athletes, um, you know, you're, you're in for a very rude awakening, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just because, uh, you know, the athletes there are, 
have been doing this for a long time. And sometimes the girls outlift the guys, uh, the guys in our camp, you know, the professional girls will can outlift them. Uh, you know, if, if these high level athletes are putting in a lot of work to perfect their craft, you know, it's going to be really hard to impress anybody uh, with what you're bringing. Uh, what's more respected and uh, more desired is just an ability to learn and uh, open mindedness to incorporate uh, this technique. If you think you know everything or you're just here to, to show off, uh, uh, this camp is, is not for you. You know, we ask for, you know, your numbers and your training experience just for pairing you up with people who have uh, similar abilities or similar experiences. Because in China, you know, the athletes, they share platforms and usually they're either in the same weight class or they have the same uh, numbers, the same strength, same totals, or they're working on the same issues. And that just makes the training go more smoothly. You know, we get a sense of, of how you're lifting and your lifting history, and then uh, we pair you with uh, other participants. But we've had people as young as 16 come and people in their 50s. So like, like I said, we just look for people who are open-minded and willing to learn. Well, Manuel, this has been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been extremely useful for me as I look to tackle my own weightlifting technique issues. But thank you again for coming on the show and really sharing your story and all of this information on Chinese weightlifting. Uh, great. Yeah, I hope it was useful and uh, I hope it helps your listeners. Thank you so much. And to all the superhumans listening out there, have an absolutely excellent day. Superhumans. Before you go, can I ask two favors? Did you enjoy that episode? If so, can you send me an email at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com? Provide any feedback, positive or negative. I would love to hear from you. And for those of you who have really taken advantage of that, you know I respond to each email. Secondly, if you did enjoy the episode, can you head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, any one of your favorite podcast listening platforms, and give Decoding Superhuman a five-star rating. It would really be appreciated. And then finally, for those of you who are looking at taking an informed approach to health, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com. Check out what we have going on over there. And if you want to schedule a free 15-minute discovery call with me, you're going to have that option. Superhumans, have an absolutely epic day. And remember, as always, choose health.